in this house today. We have many great soldiers of our country. We honor you. We salute you. We love you. We appreciate you. And I just want the rest of us to know who you are. So we're not going to applaud or anything like that, but I do want us to see who these people are that we love, that we appreciate, that we value, that built the fires of freedom we warm by, that dug these wells of liberty that we continue to drink from. So I want to ask you, if you are a veteran, if you are the widow of a veteran, would you please stand at this time in the balcony down below also where we can see who you are? Just remain standing, please. Remain standing. Look around, church. See who these people are. Thank you very much. We're in your debt. I'm happy to remind us also this morning that in this house are not only many great soldiers of this nation, but here with us also there are many great soldiers of our Lord. I won't ask us all to stand. I will not do that, but we'd all stand now, wouldn't we? Because we're trying to be great and noble servants, soldiers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is thrilling to know that we serve a commander in Jesus who has never known defeat. He is called in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 the captain of our salvation. And it is great that we have a Christ such as this. It is great that we have soldiers such as those who have gathered with us today. As you know, yesterday was in our nation Veterans Day. And we do well as a nation to honor these men and women, their families, in many cases, who have been left behind. We do well to honor these folks not just on Veterans Day, but every day. So thank you for all that you do, all that you have done, all that you continue to do to represent the best of America and we soldiers in the Lord's Army as we continue to represent the best that we find in the Lord's Church. <clears throat> this morning I'd like to direct our minds in that direction, the direction of a soldier. Think about the qualities that make a soldier a good soldier, a faithful soldier. It might surprise you to note that in our Bible, soldiers are almost always referenced in a very positive light. Back when I was much younger, there were more preachers than do this now, but there were preachers who would stand up and they would encourage us to not serve in the military. They would encourage us to not become policemen, to not involve ourselves in any way in the political realm. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, they would say. We should have nothing to do with the kingdom of this world. We should not go and defend our liberties. Not the way they put it, it's the way I'd put it. We should expect other people to defend us, but not we ourselves. We should not run for office, we should not even vote, we should pay taxes, but we should not vote, and we should not serve in any type of law enforcement capacity. <clears throat> I understand the heart of those comments, I understand that we are a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual family, a spiritual nation. This world is not our home, we're just a passing through as that song says. But while we're here, it seems we have an obligation to be salt, to be light. Matthew chapter 5, 13, 14. 
we have an opportunity to be that city that is set on a hill, a light that gives hope to those around us. That's 16 and following of Matthew 5. We have privilege to be soldiers of our nation. We have privilege to be soldiers in our Lord's army. And there's nothing shameful. There's nothing unscriptural. There's nothing ungood about enlisting in our nation's armed forces, serving in law enforcement, voting, running for office, and even being, in a sense, our Caesar today. God has placed his people on this earth in order to help this earth to be a better place, a safer place. And the people who have stood, the widows who have stood, are part of the reason that our world is safer, that our world is better, that we have the freedom to assemble today and do what we're seeking to do. Let the world know whose side we're on to worship our God, as Jesus put it, in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. A centurion was a Roman soldier who was in charge of about 100 other soldiers. And in our New Testament in particular, centurions are praised by God. They are praised by the Son of God. Now, when you think about who this centurion was, that is somewhat surprising because this centurion was a man of war. This centurion was a man of violence. He had blood on his hand. That's how he achieved the rank of centurion. Today, both this morning and tonight, we'll examine in particular three centurions who made a very big impression on God, who made, in a sense, a very big impression on Christ. And these are three men who should make a very big impression on us because they had qualities of a faithful soldier, had qualities of a good soldier. And we that are soldiers in the army of our God, we would do well to embrace the qualities, the characteristics, the virtues of these men of war, these men of violence that we'll examine this morning and tonight. I invite you to open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we'll begin reading with verse 1. One of these centurions we'll look at today had a faith that amazed Jesus. Another had a faith that confessed Jesus. Another had a faith that compelled him to follow Jesus. We're looking first at this centurion who had a faith that compelled him to live in such a way that Jesus was amazed by this man. He marveled at his great faith. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. And when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, that he there is Jesus. He entered Capernaum. Capernaum, you may need to know this to get into heaven. This was, in a sense, Christ's headquarters for his Galilean operations. And a centurion servant, not his son, not his wife, not his best friend, his servant, someone who worked for the man, a centurion servant, Notice, who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So the first attribute, the first quality I see of a centurion that is impressive here, he loved people. He loved even lowly people. Good soldiers love people. Good soldiers love people so much they're willing to die for people. What did Jesus say? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Soldiers love not just their friends, but also their nation, and we'll see that here in this passage. They're willing even to lay down lives for complete strangers. We that are soldiers in the army of our Lord, 
we must be known for our love. Even a to die for love. And you understand, when you and I love each other enough to die for, then surely we're going to treat each other with respect. Surely we'll treat each other with kindness. People who have a to die for love, they never slander. They never accuse. They never think badly of other people. They never speak badly of other people. So let us first be soldiers who are committed to loving one another and to love our nation, to love our spiritual nation, our forever family. He loves people. That's probably not the first characteristic we think of when we go in the direction in our, in our thoughts of Roman centurion, man of violence, man of war, man of a tender heart who cares for others. This man is sick, ready to die, desperate circumstances. Verse 3, so when he heard about Jesus, wonder how he heard about Jesus. Hopefully the followers of Jesus were talking about Jesus. It is a great question that we do well to ask ourselves, how many people are hearing about Jesus from us? They hear about the weather from us. They hear about our ball team from us. They hear about our grandchildren from us. And all that has its place. But how many people are hearing about Jesus from us? We cannot be ashamed to talk about Jesus. We cannot be ashamed to put in a good word for him every day, everywhere, around everybody. People have got to hear about Jesus from Jesus' people. If not from us, from whom? Talk about Christ. As I understand these passages about how he's mediating for us, he's litigating for us in heaven, he's talking about us. Remember he said, whoever confesses me, meaning the Son of God, before men, him will he also confess before our Father, his Father, who is in heaven. We want Jesus to put in a good word for us. Let's be sure we're putting in a good word for him. Talk about Christ. Talk about Christ. Somebody here is talking about Jesus, and so the centurion gets word. Jesus is in the area. When he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. Something else impresses me about this Roman centurion, this soldier, he knew where to go for help. He knew to turn to Jesus. We must always seek Jesus. We must always seek to do his bidding. We must always seek his will. We must always seek his assistance in whatever we're attempting that is good in our lives. We seek Jesus when we worship Jesus. We seek Jesus when we sing to Jesus. We seek Jesus when we pray through Jesus to the Father. Today we're seeking Jesus. On Monday, let's seek Jesus. On Tuesday, let's seek Jesus. Let's always be seekers of Jesus. And then you notice verse 5. Now I want to read 4. And when he came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. It's not on your list on the wall, but you see this is a soldier who has a good reputation. Want to be great soldiers of our Lord? We got to be behaving in such a way that people will think highly of us, that they will speak highly of us. If they don't think highly of us, how can they possibly think highly of the God who made us, of the Jesus whose name we wear? Live our lives in such a way so that people will think good thoughts about us, say good words about us. And of course, it's not about us. We're not wanting glory. We're not wanting praise. But we understand of this early church, remember that they increased in favor. They had favor with all the people. Jesus, the same was said about him. If your neighbors don't like you, co-workers don't like us, classmates don't like us, then they're going to be less inclined to want to hear something of us about Jesus. Now, <clears throat> to be liked by the world can be a dangerous and slippery slope. 
If to be liked by the neighbors, we've got to maybe talk in a worldly way, dress in a worldly way, laugh at worldly things, be entertained by worldly things, then we are better off to be less liked by the neighbors. But be a pleasant person. Be a kind person. Be the happiest person in the classroom, the workplace, the most diligent employee. You understand? This is a Roman centurion that was such a good man that even the Jews said to Jesus of him, he's worth your time. He's worthy of your efforts. Good reputation. <clears throat> and then verse 5, for he loves our nation, I like this phrase, and has built us a synagogue. A good soldier is going to be a good builder. This soldier built a synagogue. That's pretty remarkable to me. Probably got his hundred employees, his hundred soldiers out there and, and working with him to do this thing. He's a Roman. He doesn't worship in a synagogue. He doesn't believe in God like these people do in all probability. And yet, he reaches out to them. Olive Branch wants to get along, wants to have good relations. And he builds for these people a synagogue. It is good that we be builders of good things. We're trying to build a great life. We're trying to build great families. We're trying to, with God's assistance, build a greater congregation. We're try trying to build a, a greater community for our children and our grandchildren. Good soldiers are going to be great builders. We, have, we frequently think of good soldiers as people who are known for destruction and carnage. And ruination. Good builders build great things. Build great countries. We build great lives. Again, all with the help of God. It is very easy to tear something down. You ever built a sandcastle? Takes a lot of time. Takes a lot of effort. Takes a lot of skill. Takes a lot of patience. How long? How much trouble? How qualified? Do you have to be to walk over and just kick it down? What was built over long periods of time, not just talking about sandcastles, talking about reputation, talking about families, talking about many things we're actively building. It's so easy for us to, with one word or one unkind deed, to tear all that down. Friendships even can be broken apart very quickly that were built over decades. Congregations can be splintered, can be fragmented, can be not maybe destroyed, but greatly damaged very, very quickly. And let's be of the people who are builders. Let's not be of the people who find it so easy to tear somebody down or tear something down. That's not what we've been called by God to do. I love studying the book of Nehemiah. Because when we look at those people who assisted Nehemiah in building this great wall, and they built it in 52 days all the way around the city of Jerusalem without computer programs, without the, the finest of machinery that we have access today. And the key to that was, you remember, these people had a mind to work, which is another way of saying they had a mind to build. So if we're going to be practical and applicable of this lesson, right, we got to ask ourselves, what am I actively building now? What did I build this week? What am I building on today? What will I be constructing in the next few days of my life? A good soldier is going to be building. Please help us build up this church. Help us build up our families. Help us build this community into a better, safer place for all. We need that. To do that, all of us have got to have a mind to work. All of us have got to have a mind to come together and build. Can't have everybody on the left side building and those on the right side. Just doesn't work that way. Good soldier because he's a builder. Build something great starting now. Verse 6. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, by the way, the Jewish leaders of that day, they prevented, they had laws that they had made which made it illegal 
for a Jew to enter the house of a Gentile. So Jesus is about to really turn their world upside down in this community of Capernaum. He's going to barge right in. That'd be a scandal. Jesus goes with them. When he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. This soldier is great because he has great humility. Great people don't think they're great. Don't pe great people help other people to feel great about themselves. He's an extremely humble man, and yet he is a superior to many people. You notice how he describes himself, verse 8. For also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, notice this, he marveled at him, turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, see, everywhere Jesus went, there's a crowd. Imagine a life like that. I say to you, I have not found such faith, such great faith, not even in Israel. He's pointing at these folks saying, you don't have the faith that this fellow has. And you see this word, verse 9, he marveled at him. That is the only time you'll see Jesus marveling in our entire Bible at someone's faith. The only other times we read of Christ marveling, it was at somebody's unbelief rather than their belief. So this is high praise from Christ. This is rare praise from Christ for this centurion. He had a faith that led Jesus to marvel, to be amazed. And we should have the same kind of faith. A faith that amazes. A faith that prompts Christ to, to marvel. A faith that understands Jesus can do all things. Jesus has done all things. He's continuing to do all things. And he will do in the future all great things for us, such as whatever we have need not want. Jesus knows best. Gives us all we want. Our lives will be a disaster. Gives us all we need. Lives will be marvelous. The faith of this centurion, it was rewarded. Verse 10, and those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. When we're great soldiers, when we have the faith like this centurion had, good things are going to happen. When you come back tonight, we're going to start with Mark chapter 15, verse 39. King James puts that verse this way. And when the centurion, another centurion, which stood over against him, the, the hymn there is Jesus as he's being crucified. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Roman centurion said, what no one else was willing to say, truly this man was the Son of God. He looked at Jesus. He was impressed with Jesus. He confessed Jesus. We'll explore that more fully tonight. And also one other centurion story we'll look at this evening. Would you bow with me, please?